بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهديه الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد So now we're on the hadith of Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه أن رجلا قال للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أو سني قال لا تغضب فردد مرارا قال لا تغضب رواه البخاري In this hadith of Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه He states that a man came or that a man said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, advise me, counsel me, advise me. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, la taghdab, don't become angry. The advice was, don't become angry. Faraddada miraran, so the man kept saying, advise me, advise me more, advise me. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept saying, The same advice, don't get angry. Don't get angry. And the hadith is in Al-Bukhari. So this is now talking about this characteristic of anger. The hadith mentions this emotion, this characteristic of anger. Al-Ghadab wal-Ridha khaslatani wa sajiyyatani tubi'a alayhim al-insanu li fa'idatin wa maslahatin. فالذي لا يغضب يكون ناقصا لكن لا بد أن يستعمل الغضب في محله فإن تجاوز محله ضرة. The Sheikh says that anger and pleasure, satisfaction, being happy at something or being angry at something, those are two characteristics, two descriptions that every person has naturally within themselves. Naturally in every person you have anger and you have pleasure or satisfaction or being happy. Both of those are within a person naturally. So even with anger, a person who doesn't become angry ever, then that's a deficiency. It's a deficiency. However, it must be noted that if a person becomes angry, then it must be within its due, due or right place, within the deserved place. It must not be understood when we say that a person who never becomes angry, that is a deficiency that you must now start to become angry at things which there is no need, or in things where it is actually incorrect for you to become angry. But we'll see now what this hadith means. What it means that anger is a natural emotion and that everybody has it within them. Sheikh says it must be used in its correct place. Anger, this emotion, it must be used in its correct place. And if a person was to use it out of its correct place, if a person was to use it out of its correct place, then that would become harmful. It would become harmful. And this anger we know it is the opposite of being pleased or happy or satisfied with something. The The Shaykh gives an explanation of what anger typically is. He mentions, and this is mentioned in some narrations, in some ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the description of anger. And he mentions that anger is when the blood boils. The blood boils of an individual when he becomes in that state of anger. And the veins, it's as if they're about to burst. For some people now, then this is the description of anger. And this is mentioned in some narrations regarding how the blood it boils and the veins, it's as if they are bursting. The veins as if they are popping from this extreme anger. And that leads a person 
or that is an emotion where a person desires revenge upon someone who has angered him. So this anger, it exists. And the shaykh says there's none of us. None of us who doesn't ever get angry. All of us get angry at some point. Anger overcomes us all at some point. We are human. لكن العاقل والمؤمن يتصرف في غضبه ولا ينفذه However, the intelligent person, the one who is intelligent, then he behaves appropriately when he feels this anger. He, is, he has the ability to control himself at the time of anger. Has the ability to still behave in the correct manner at the time of anger. That is what the believer does. That is what the intelligent person does. At the time of anger, he behaves and he conducts himself in the correct manner. أَمَّا الْأَحْمَكُ وَالْجَاهِلُ As for the individual who is foolish and the individual who is ignorant, the ignorant, foolish individuals, then in their situation, the anger may well lead them on to committing acts that are dispraiseworthy. Their anger leads them to commit acts that are dispraiseworthy. And that can be understood in a variety of things. The Shaykh says, Kalqatil. For example, murder, killing someone. How often do you hear of an individual from extreme anger? seeking revenge upon another, so they go and commit murder, this crime of taking a soul, as we've already mentioned in a previous hadith, we already mentioned Islam makes it haram for you to go and take a soul, to murder someone without the Islamic right, it is not possible, it is haram to do so, so a person out of anger may go and commit that act, of murdering someone, of killing someone out of revenge, or whatever the other motive may be. Waljarh, or harming someone and injuring someone, physically beating someone, all of that may occur from a person due to his extreme anger. This is all from those who are foolish and ignorant and are not able to conduct themselves in the correct manner when they become angry. And you see this type of thing all of the time. You hear it on the news all of the time. You read it on the news that this person went and killed that one. The business partner killed his business partner. The husband killed the wife. You hear these types of things all of the time and the stories behind them. Because this was happening or that was happening or he took too much money. This one stole the money so he out of anger went and killed that one. These stories they occur all of the time from those people. The foolish ones who engage in these types of activities who are unable to control themselves in these situations of anger. Or out of anger, you will see some people, they abuse others. They abuse others and they speak in an ill manner. And they defame others. And they speak in a manner which is not befitting. With language that is not befitting. So they swear and they abuse and they mock and they belittle and they lie and they slander all types of evil speech all types of profanities when these individuals are in a state of anger because they are unable to control themselves due to their lack of intelligence due to their foolishness another example of what anger can do to people is that you will see certain people, they cut off ties from their families. So a brother will not speak to his brother for maybe years, blood brothers, same father, same mother, and they won't speak to each other for years perhaps. A father to his son or a mother to her daughter, uh, a person with his uncle or auntie, whatever it may be. A person may cut off his own relatives and abandon his own relatives out of anger. They did this to me or they did that to me or this event occurred or that event occurred. And as a consequence, perhaps they don't speak for years and years. Again, this is from their foolishness that their anger has led them 
to abandoning their own blood brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers. So this is something that anger can lead to too. So the Shaykh says, فَالْغَضَبُ يَحْمِلُ الْإِنسَانَ عَلَى مَهَالِكِ إِلَّا إِذَا اسْتَعْمَلَهُ إِسْتِعْمَالًا حَسَنًا فِي مَحَلِّهِ فَإِنَّهُ يَسْلَمُ مِنْ شَرِّهِ So these are the types of things that anger can lead a person upon. These are the types of dispraiseworthy acts that an individual may fall into due to anger. So the Shaykh says, a person must control this emotion and use it in the correct manner. Use this emotion in the correct manner. This emotion of anger, this characteristic that is naturally within every person. Because otherwise it leads to the people committing and engaging and practicing all types of evil acts that are outside of what Islam has prescribed. They are fall victim to the whisperings of the shaitan at the time of anger. They do not think logically at the time of anger. The blood, it boils in the veins, they are bursting, and from that anger they go and commit these evil acts, these forbidden acts. So this individual in this hadith, هَذَا الرَّجُلُ طَلَبَ مِنَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, This man, he came and requested from the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم to advise him with some advice that would benefit him. He came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم to ask for some advice that would benefit him, that would be useful to him. Advice that he could use in his life, something of benefit and of use to him, something of advantage to him. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, as the advice, لا تغضب, don't get angry. This is the advice, control your anger. When situations arise, when circumstances arise, something happens, someone does something, someone says something, Control yourself, control your anger. That is the advice. So it is as if this man thought that this advice was something minor. Don't get angry. He thought that maybe this advice is something minor. It's not really the type of major advice he was hoping for maybe. Or that he was thinking about maybe. He thought this is something minor, don't get angry. Not to get angry, he thought that's a minor piece of advice. So he kept saying again, advise me. Expecting something else from the Prophet ﷺ. But the Prophet ﷺ kept repeating again the same advice. Do not get angry. Do not get angry, control the anger. And every time the Prophet ﷺ kept saying the same thing, he wouldn't add anything extra to it. Every time the man said, advise me, the Prophet ﷺ said, don't get angry. The advice is, control your anger. Do not get angry. So what was the wisdom behind that? As Shaykh al-Fawzan says, what was the wisdom behind the Prophet ﷺ continuously repeating this advice of one controlling his anger? قَالَ بَعْضُ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ Some of the scholars said, لَعَلَّ هَذَا الرَّجُلَ كَانَ مَعْرُوفًا بِالْغَضَبِ والنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يجيب كل إنسان بحسب حاجته فأوساه الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم وخصه بهذه الوصية لعلمه بحاله وهي وصية له ولغيره Some of the scholars said that maybe this person who came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he was known to be someone who got angry a lot some of the scholars say in this hadith, this man who came to seek advice, it could be that this particular individual was known to be someone who gets angry a lot. Known to be someone who loses his temper a lot. So because that was known, when he came to the Prophet ﷺ to seek advice, then the Prophet ﷺ advised him with the item, with the advice that was most suitable to him in his situation. Because it was known that he was somebody who loses his temper and becomes angry. So the Prophet ﷺ advised him on that point. Don't get angry. Don't lose your temper. Don't become angry. Kept repeating that. Don't get angry. Don't get angry. 
So some of the scholars say maybe that was the reason that this individual was known for anger. So the Prophet ﷺ advised him upon his situation, upon his characteristic of not to get angry therefore. And that is an advice for that man and it is an advice for all of us. Because all of us we have within us this anger and all of us we experience that anger at some time. So therefore the advice is applicable to everyone to control their anger and to control themselves in those situations and circumstances. فَكُلُّ إِنسَانٍ مَطْلُوبٌ مِّنْهُ أَلَّا يَغْضَبُ So every person, it is required from him not to get angry. لِمَا يَتَرَتَّبُ عَلَى الْغَضَبُ مِنَ الْأَضْرَارِ Because of all of the evil consequences that arise from somebody becoming angry. The evil results, what happens when somebody gets angry. Many evil things can occur. مَا مِنَّا أَحَدٌ لَا يَجِدُ فِي نَفْسِهِ شَيْئًا مِنَ الْغَضَبُ there's not any of us who doesn't find within ourselves some type of anger at times. وَلَكِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ الْمُؤْمِنَ الْعَاقِلْ يَأْخُذُ بِالْحِلْمَ However, the person who is a believer and he is intelligent, then he behaves in a manner that is calming. He calms himself in that situation. He uses his wisdom in that situation uses his self-control in that situation when he becomes angry. لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ جَلَّ وَعَلَى يَقُولُ فِي صِفَاتِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Because indeed Allah has said, one of the characteristics of the believers is, وَإِذَا مَا غَضِبُوا هُمْ يَغْفِرُونَ لَمْ يَقُلْ لَا يَغْضَبُونَ بَلْ قَالْ وَإِذَا مَا غَضِبُوا هُمْ يَغْفِرُونَ فَيَغْفِرُ الْإِنسَانُ وَيَحْلُمْ هَذَا هُوَ الْمَطْلُوبُ so Allah said, when they become angry, they forgive. If they become angry, they forgive. So this is what's required of a person, to have wisdom, to have forbearance, to have patience, and not to lose himself in that moment of anger. That's what's required, to be patient and not to lose himself in that moment of anger. That's why it's mentioned in another hadith. In another hadith it says, وَلِهَذَا قَالَ النَّبِيَ سَلَّمْ لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ بِالسُّرْعَةِ The person of strength and power is not the person who can physically take you down. That isn't somebody who is powerful and strong and mighty. Somebody who can physically take you down, that's not the one who is powerful and mighty. The Prophet ﷺ said, الشَّدِيدُ الَّذِي يَمْلِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الْغَضَبِ The powerful and the strong one isn't just somebody who's physically strong and they can take you down. That's not the powerful and strong one. The powerful and strong one, the Prophet ﷺ said, is the one who can control himself when he's angry. The one who can control himself when he is angry. That is the one who is powerful and strong in of himself. Not the one who can physically take you down. That isn't strength. Somebody becomes angry and they are stronger than you physically, so they take you down and that indicates their foolishness at the time of anger. Doesn't indicate their strength. The strength internally is the one who can control himself at that time of anger. هَذَا هُوَ الشَّدِيدُ الْقَوِيُّ الَّذِي يَمْلِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الْغَضَبِ So this is the one who is powerful and strong, the one who can control himself at the time of anger. وَالنَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يغضب لكنه لا ينفذ. And it's mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ would become angry. He would become angry at certain events and things, but he would control the affair and behave in the correct manner. إِلَّا إِذَا كَانَ الْغَضَبُ لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ So this is now going to explain what did we mean at the beginning when we said, unless you become angry in the right place. Anger in the right place is if it is anger for the sake of Allah and the religion. Somebody abuses the religion, somebody abuses the revelations, somebody abuses something related to the religion, then you would feel anger, and rightly so. You would feel anger in of yourselves, you would feel that due to this oppression or transgression of an individual against the religion of Allah, فَكَانَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ حَلِيمًا لا ينتقم لنفسه أبدا. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he was forbearing. He had patience and he would never take revenge for himself. And he would get angry if it was to do with the religion, nothing to do with himself. But even then, we say 
If a person becomes angry with something related to the religion, still you must behave in the correct manner. That doesn't mean you're allowed to behave as you please if you get angry with regards to something to do with the religion. As some of them they do. When the kuffar and the disbelievers, they have done so over the recent times to mock the Prophet ﷺ with their paintings and their drawings and other affairs, then that is an abuse of the religion. And it angers the believers. However, some of them, some of the Muslims, their anger at this time, it led them to commit haram once again. It doesn't mean that this anger which is justifiable in of yourselves due to the oppression or the transgression against the religion, against the religion, doesn't mean you're allowed to yourself then go and transgress. Because transgression has occurred in that way, it doesn't mean you're allowed to go and transgress as some of them did. They went and blew up some embassies and they killed some uh, citizens from other countries, some disbelievers, some people who were not Muslims. But that wasn't permissible. In this situation when that occurred, it wasn't permissible for them to go and kill other citizens and to go and blow up embassies. That was, a, that was haram still. So a person even at the time of anger, when it, it is linked to the religion, the person must still behave in the correct and proper manner. We turn to the scholars, the ones of wisdom, in order to realize and understand how to behave in that situation. Then the Shaykh mentions that the Prophet ﷺ never used to take revenge for himself. Despite the fact, despite the fact that the Prophet ﷺ faced so much oppression and transgression, from the disbelievers. The Prophet ﷺ faced so much transgression against him from the disbelievers, yet he never took revenge for himself. If the transgression was upon himself, then he never took revenge for himself. He never went to seek revenge, to take revenge for his own self. And this is how a person should behave in following the example of the Prophet wasallam, that a person does not become angry for himself, for his own pride, for his own uh, pride and honor and respect. He wants to maintain his status. So he gets angry for himself to want to take revenge for himself upon this other person. A person does not behave in this manner. He does not seek revenge for himself. That person, if you have been transgressed against, somebody has transgressed against you, they've done something wrong against you, then do not become angry and transgress against them. Rather, look at the religion of Islam and take your rights in the correct and appropriate manner. You take a right back, if the religion allows you a right in that situation, then you take it back in the correct and appropriate manner. And if you forgive and you overlook the affair, then perhaps in certain circumstances that is the most suitable thing to do, to forgive and to overlook the affair, and not to become angry over it or to pursue it. وَهَكَذَا الْمُؤْمِنُ يَقْتَدِي بِالرَّسُولِ صلى الله عليه وسلم لَا يَغْضَبُ لِنَفْسِهِ بَلْ يَحْلُمُ وَيَغْفِرُ وَيُحْسِنُ إِلَى مَنْ أَغْضَبَ Rather a person should attempt to forgive the one who has angered him, and should attempt to calm the situation and use forbearance and patience and not to become angry and to retaliate and to react in a manner which is transgression in of itself. That is not appropriate. Rather the person who is able to control himself and to attempt to rectify and correct the affairs, then that is better. Knowing that the Prophet ﷺ himself never took revenge for himself. He would never take revenge for himself even if the people, they oppressed him. So a person, if he is able to overlook the oppression of the people upon himself, a person abuses you, lies against you, slanders against you, then you take your right accordingly in Islam, rectify the slander or the lie, rectify that and clarify what is the truth, and leave the affair at that. There is no need for uh, to take revenge upon that person or to go out to seek revenge upon that person. Rectify and clarify what the truth is, Rectify that this is a particular issue that is a lie. Rectify the truth and leave the affair. And not to pursue and to seek revenge upon the people. The Prophet ﷺ never sought revenge for himself. And the Shaykh mentions, فَمَنْ عَفَى وَأَصْلَحَ فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ 
that a person who can forgive, who can pardon, and can attempt to rectify, then that is better. That is better and his reward is with Allah. A person who is able to attempt to rectify the affairs. And all of this, it must be done with wisdom. All of these issues, they are dealt with in wisdom to such an extent that sometimes it could be the case. It could be the case that maybe there are some people who are so far, so far gone in their oppression and transgression that they do not take any advice and they do not take any counsel from anyone. But they continue upon their transgression and their oppression against the people. Then sometimes in extreme situations like that, then it's mentioned pardoning those people in terms of leaving them to continue as they are may not be the correct course of action. Because by doing that, you are allowing them to continue and to persist upon their wrongdoing. So maybe sometimes in some circumstances, it may be the case that to pardon someone, it may not be the right course of action. Because by doing that, it only increases them in arrogance and increases them in oppression and transgression. But that must be judged with wisdom. People will come and they will abuse that. They will come and they will abuse that using it incorrectly. Anyone who oppresses them even slightly, they say, yes, this applies to him. You can't forgive him. You can't forgive him. You have to take revenge against him. You have to do this against him. Do that against him. That is in those situations where genuinely there is a person who does not listen. They do not take advice. They do not take counsel. You do not see any goodness from them at all. Then for this person, rectify what needs rectifying. Clarify to the people what needs clarifying. Make the affair clear and blatant regarding that if it is required in that way. Because perhaps that response may be the factor that causes the person to react in the proper manner and to step down from this oppression and transgression. That could be in certain circumstances. But generally speaking, generally speaking, the Shaykh, he explains here, he explains here, generally speaking, you attempt to rectify, you attempt to correct the affairs between the people, to advise each other, just as the other ayats of the Qur'an and places in the Sunnah, it mentions in the Qur'an, Imam Ahmad said, patience is mentioned over 90 times, or approximately 90 times, showing you the great virtue of patience. Even if a person oppresses you or abuses you, to be patient upon that, knowing as well that if that person persists upon this way, and he doesn't want to retract, and he doesn't want to make tawbah, doesn't want to seek forgiveness, then on the day of judgment, you still have your right from him. On the day of judgment, when the weighing scales are put out, from amongst the affairs that will be in your wing scales are the oppressions of the other people. You will take good deeds from them, the ones who oppressed you and wronged you. So a person, if he's able to be patient and he's able to forgive that affair and to overlook the affair, then this is goodness. If he's able to attempt to rectify the affair in that way, then this is goodness. فَهَذَا هُوَ عِلَاجُ الْغَضَبِ So the Shaykh says, therefore, the cure to anger the cure to anger is this. أولاً, firstly, مَهْمَا أَمْكَنَ أَنَّكَ لَا تَغْضَبُ Firstly, as much as you are able, do not become angry. As much as you are able, in as much of the circumstances, control yourself and do not become angry. ثانياً, إِذَا غَضِبْتَ فَلَا تُنَفِّذْ بَلْ عَلَيْكَ بِالصَّبْرِ وَالتَّحَمُّلِ وَالْحِلْمِ if you do find yourself in a situation of extreme anger and you're unable to control yourself, the anger overcomes you, then a person has to behave in the correct manner. Control yourself in that state of anger and do not go and do what your anger desires from you to do. Your anger desires from you to go and beat another person up or to go and take revenge on a person, to go and kill a person. But in that state of anger, if that occurs, you attempt to control yourself and not to fall into the haram. And that's why it's mentioned in some other narrations, if a person becomes angry, what are you supposed to do? Seek refuge from the shaitan. Say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. Seek refuge in Allah from the shaitan who whispers this anger into you. Similarly, it's mentioned in some of the narrations to go and make wudu. Go and make wudu and cool yourself with the, with the water in that state of anger. Go and make the wudu and refresh yourself and cool yourself with the water. Similarly, it's mentioned if you're angry, then before you lie down, firstly, sit down. If you're angry and you're, you're jumping around with anger and uh, bursting, then sit down. Sit down to calm yourself. And if you still find yourself in a state of anger, then lie down to calm yourself. 
This is mentioned in the narrations. These are mentioned ways of a person to control himself. If you're in a state of anger and running around, then sit down. Calm yourself. If you're not able there, lie down even more. Lie down to calm yourself and to remove that anger and seek refuge in Allah. Make the wudu. Make the wudu. Lie down, relax. To remove that anger and the whisperings of the shaitan from you. So this is what's mentioned regarding the anger. And that a person must attempt to control himself when it comes to this anger. And not to allow that to cause you to commit error or wrongdoing. This is the way of Ahlul Sunnah. That you take these narrations and you act upon them and you implement them. As for the people of innovation, the people of deviance, then they don't take these narrations and act upon them in the correct manner whatsoever. Ikhwan al-Muslimin and those types of people now, anything happens across the world, that's it. Their justification, their dalil, their evidence is, look what the kuffar are doing to us over there, so we're allowed to go and do this over here. The kuffar, they blow up uh, Muslims and they kill Muslims, so we're allowed to go and blow up and kill Muslims. This is their mentality, out of anger. They do this to our women, they do that. We know these things, they happen. We know it's happening across the world. That does not mean that it's permissible for you now in this state of anger to go and commit oppression and haram yourself. It doesn't make haram halal for you. It doesn't make the haram halal for you. Rather, a person who has this wisdom in his mind and he understands the narrations, just as Sheikh Muhammad bin Saleh al said, when all of these atrocities are occur- occurring across the world, all of these evil things occurring across the world, all of these bad things happening to the Muslims across the world, then you have to look at this with the Islamic perspective. Look at this from the Islamic point of view, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, al-asbab al shariya as the Shaykh mentions, the Islamic reasonings, the legislative reasonings, just as Allah said, ما ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس That the corruption has occurred on the land and the earth because of what the hands of the people have earned. So when you see all of this oppression, then look to yourselves and look at the Islamic reasonings behind this and attempt to rectify those reasonings. Rectify those causes. Allah gave strength and honor to the Salaf, to the Sahaba because of the Iman and the practicing and the clinging to the Quran and the Sunnah. So now if the people have abandoned that, if they've abandoned that, then where do they expect the honor to come from? Honor is in clinging to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, not in abandoning the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So do not be influenced by the likes of the takfiris and the ikhwan al-Muslimin and those talking about, look what they're doing here, look what they're doing there, and they use all of these emotions and anger to try to incite the people to go and commit that which is haram. Whereas the hadith of the Prophet tells us, be patient, be calm. And act in the manner which is appropriate. When oppression occurs, that doesn't mean you don't do anything, but you act in the manner that is appropriate. Make dua for those believers. You aid them in whatever way is possible, legitimately to aid them. But it doesn't mean you go and commit haram yourself, or you go like the takfiris and blow up places and embassies and kill people. This is haram and this is not from the way of Ahlul Sunnah. The way of Ahlul Sunnah is to be upon the Quran and the Sunnah. To be upon the texts and the methodology of the Salaf. So we ask Allah to make us firm upon that way. And we'll conclude upon that. And we have a few minutes if there are any questions we're able to answer. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Is there any like, benefit or reward in um, following the Prophet ﷺ with regards to worldly matters or his own preference? Like, for example, if he worked, walked a certain way or he didn't like a certain food or color, etc. etc. The scholars, they sometimes mention that if a person was to do that, then it, it demonstrates your, your, like, your love for the Prophet ﷺ, that you're trying to be like the Prophet ﷺ. But there is a difference between certain things that were just tradition and things that are sunnah. Things that are sunnah, of course, you do them and you get reward for them. Things that are tradition... They were just culture at the time, cultural things that they used to do at that time when they lived, and it's not a part of the religion as such. It's not something you get a reward for if you do this or that. They were cultural things that they used to do at the time. Then those things in of themselves, they are not something that has reward in them. They are cultural things. However, sometimes the scholars, they say, if you were to do some of those things with that intention that you want to emulate the Prophet ﷺ, but it is hoped, it is hoped that maybe you'll get some reward for that. 
But there is a difference between just cultural things and the actual sunnah. You can't start making cultural things into things of sunnah. That the Prophet ﷺ, uh, they used to do certain things at that time. Even uh, the mode of transport, they used to ride on camels and donkeys. Does that mean now that we have to start saying it's sunnah to ride in that way and to travel in that way? As some of the deviants they do. Hamza Yusuf, he says, it's a bid'ah to use an alarm clock to wake up for fajr. It's a bid'ah to use an alarm clock. This shows you the lack of complete understanding of the religion. Completely not understanding the principles of the religion. To say that an alarm clock is a bid'ah. Turn off your mobiles and turn off your alarm clocks and miss your fajr every day. This is the, the statement of those people of deviation. The statement of the people who don't understand the principles of the religion. It's one thing that is bid'ah linked to the religion and, and worshipping Allah and obedience. Other affairs. Now you can say anything is bid'ah then. It's bid'ah to use this plastic bottle. Did they have these bottles at the time of the Prophet ﷺ? So bid'ah, halas. This table, did they have tables like this? Bid'ah, everything is bid'ah. You can't do anything. This is the way of the ignorance. But rather you have to, you have to look at the affairs carefully. Look at the Quran and the Sunnah, practice everything that is mentioned clearly. And as for the traditions, then they are traditions. It can't be said in that way that these are sunnah and you must and it's an obligation. But for the one who attempts to do that and practice some of those within the bounds of everything else too. You have to be careful to do everything within the bounds. The Prophet ﷺ, for example, he used to wear a turban. But now maybe a person, if he goes to a, a particular place where there aren't many Muslims with a turban, etc., it would be unsuitable. So you have to look at the affair and the situation and how you're practicing and how you're trying to emulate the example of the Prophet ﷺ in the traditional aspects. Hmm. I'm not sure about the... Uh, I'm sure there's fatawa from the scholars regarding this new technology now, but uh, I haven't come across it regarding that. Allah A'ana. I'm sure there will be fatawa. We'll try to find some fatawa regarding these new technologies and having Quran on the phones and things and taking it in. Uh, we'll try to find some fatawa regarding it. I'm sure there will be fatawa now about these phones and uh, Quran and things like that recorded on them. Inshallah, we'll try to find something. But I, I don't remember a fatawa about it. So we'll conclude there for today then. And inshallah next week again at 7.30 The next hadith Slaughtering If you're going to slaughter then slaughter properly The actions that you do then do them in precision Inshallah we'll start that for next week